All right, Krista and Kate, are you ready to get started? Perfect. All right, um, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today at Hatfields Marine Science Center's research seminar. Um, my name is Cinnamon Moffitt. I'm the research program manager at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center in Newport, Oregon, and I'll be your host today. Um, if you've been at seminars in the past, you know my little spiel, but I'm going to give it again. Um, this is a Zoom format, so um, we ask that you keep your mics, cameras, and screen shares turned off at this time, but we do encourage you to ask questions. Um, please use the chat box, which you can find by scrolling your mouse to the bottom of your Zoom page, and you'll see a little pop-up. Um, you're welcome to put in any questions there, and our speakers today will answer those at the end of their presentation. Um, I wanted to also let you know that today's uh, presentation is uh, being recorded um, and most likely will be posted um, on the uh, research uh, page, which is the Oregon State University Hatfield Marine Science Center past seminar page. And I am putting that in the chat box right now so you can see that link if you'd like to go um, and listen to a part of this presentation again um, or share it with others, you're welcome to do so. Um, I also just want to welcome everybody who's taking this for credit and Michael Banks is online if you need his support. Um, you can ask him questions in the chat box as well. So uh, give a little shout out for next week's seminar, same place, same time. Um, next week's seminar, which is already November, November 5th, um, is Jasmine Graham. She's from Motlet uh, Marine Lab, and she is going to talk to us in her words about the most bizarre cartilaginous fish in the ocean. So come join us and learn a little bit more about that. Um, I also just want to put in a little plug by we are going to continue the virtual um, seminar format at least through March. So if you or somebody you're working with or a collaborator or just somebody you're interested in um, connecting and having them give a seminar here at Hatfield, please let me know. Uh, we'll reach out to them together and see if we can get some speakers. Um, one of the great things about Zoom is it doesn't matter where they're from. So uh, be creative and let me know who you're thinking about. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about our upcoming events, if you uh, Google or use whatever platform you use um, and you search for HMSC and scroll to the bottom of our homepage, you'll see our calendar of events and you can see what's coming up. Um, for today, however, we have two speakers that I'm really excited to have join us. Um, they were originally scheduled last spring, um, and due to unforeseen circumstances, uh, we have now been able to reschedule them this fall. Um, so I'd like to introduce our two speakers. Um, first, we have Krista Callway. She has been with the Northwest Fishery Science Center West Coast Ground Fish Observatory Program, that's a mouthful if you say it all together, um, since 2011. She is responsible for training over 80 fisheries observers a year, and her career started in Alaska as a fishery observer herself um, and working for many programs before she became an employee with NOAA Fisheries in 2002. Krista has a BS in biology from Southampton College and Long Island University. Our second speaker is Kate Richardson. She has been an analyst with the Northwest Fisheries Science Center and the Fisheries Observer Science Program since 2017. Prior to that, she was a postdoc at the University of Washington. Um, and Kate has her PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology from the University of California, Santa Cruz. So Krista and Kate, the floor is yours. Take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Cinnamon for so patiently tolerating all the emails over the last few months as we are coordinating this. And thank you to the Science Center for having us. And uh, in my bio, I said I was an observer in Alaska. I just wanna tell you which programs I was in. I was a North Pacific ground fish observer and I went out on long line vessels, both catcher processor and shoreside. And I also did some shoreside trawl and I also was an Alaska Department of Fish, of Game, Fish and Game shellfish observer, and I deployed on red king crab and opelio trips. So anyone who's seen deadliest catch, it was those kind of boats. And during the summer, I worked for the Alaska Marine Mammal Observer Program, and we were observing the salmon drift and set net fisheries in Cook Inlet, Kodiak, and Southeast Alaska. And after that, I took a job with the North Pacific, and I was based out of Anchorage for roughly 10 years. 
And as you mentioned, I came here in 2011. So for 20 years now, I have been working in an observer program. So if I stumble, it's not for lack of experience. Who are we? Well, our official name is Fisheries Observation Science, but we're commonly referred to as the Observer Program, but we actually have two different observer programs within FOSS. We have the At Sea Hake Program, which we refer to as ASHOP. They cover the observers that go out on the Hake mothership vessels and Hake mothership catcher, uh, catcher processors. The West Coast Groundfish Observer Program covers the other fisheries along the coastline. We have a staff of over 30, and I should say I have the pleasure today of speaking with you, but I'm really representing the work of a really large team. That team is divided between federal staff that are with NOAA, and we have contractors with Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission. And we are located up and down the coast. So there's 1,300 miles of coastline from the Northern Washington all the way down to Southern California. Our headquarters is in Seattle, Washington. And the Hague program also has a pre presence at the Sandpoint campus with the Alaska Fisheries Science Center. We have a field office in Hammond right near Astoria. I'm here right now in Newport. This is where the bulk of our, our gear is stored and we do our trainings and debriefings. We also have field offices in California, in Crescent City, Eureka, and Morro Bay. So why is there even an observer program? Well, the West Coast fisheries, we didn't know a lot about them. Uh, there were 83% of rockfish species with an unknown status. We knew in the 90s it was declining. There were eight different fish stocks that were declared overfished. And in 2000, it was actually declared an economic disaster. There wasn't much discard accounting and we didn't know much other than what was landed. So there were a variety of steps that were taken to account for that. One of which was creating the observer program, but we also increased scientific trawl surveys. There was a vessel buyback program and the creation of the rockfish conservation areas, among other things. Observer programs have been used since uh, 1972, when observers were actually deployed on foreign vessels that were fishing off Alaska. But there was a big, uh, a, a big act that changed fisheries forever for us was the Magnuson-Stevens Fisheries Conservation and Management Act in 1976. That created our six different fisheries regions, the Fisheries Council. It, it claimed, so we claimed then that three to 200 miles from the US shore is called an EEZ. It's an exclusive economic zone so that we could be the ones that fish those waters and benefit from it. And that's all federally managed. Part of the MSA was also the creation of observer programs. So they're used all over the country and indeed all over the world. But in the US, there's six different regions covering 53 fisheries and annually about 70,000 sea days. So the West Coast program started in 2001, first deploying in the limited entry sable fish, fixed gear fishery, quickly went into trawl, and it's been expanding ever since. And I'll show you all the fisheries we're covering today. And 2011 was also an important milestone in our program, not just because I moved down here, but it was the start of the Catch Share program. So we'll see under our fisheries, we cover fisheries that are both federally mandated and some that are state. For our federal programs, we have the Catch Share program, which is our bottom trawl. There's some fixed gear too. Also our at sea hake and our shoreside hake. We're also covering limited entry sable fish, open access fixed gear, and the ones in yellow are the newest ones. So a few years ago, we started observing the Pacific Halibut Derby. For our state fisheries, we observe the shrimp fisheries that are up and down the coast. We do nearshore fixed gear, 
California halibut trawl, and a couple other newer ones are the ridgeback prawn and the California sea cucumber. So I've mentioned Catch Share. Catch Share is an important program. You could give a whole hour long talk on that just by itself. I won't do that. But I'm going to refer to the Catch Share program and we compare that to what we call the non-catch share. The big difference comes down to quota for our non-catch share programs. Uh, there is not an individual quota that's associated to it. There's a trip limit to how much they can catch. There's nothing that they can trade amongst themselves and the quota is gonna be based on what's landed. Catch share, they have individual quotas that they can buy, they can lease, there's something as a commodity that can be shared, and the bycatch is all accounted for. The funding between the two programs is also different. The non-catch share is paid for by the government, and the catch share program is funded by industry and has also been subsidized. The coverage rate for non-catch share is very variable depending on the fishery. So it could be as low as 6%, could be uh, much higher than that, and it's coordinated by staff with our observer program. The catch share program, a big difference here is that it's 100% covered. That was part of the regulation package that went out in 2011. We're going to account for 100% of those tows, and that's coordinated by the observer providers who hire the observers. So there's a variety of gear types that you come across on our coast. We've got trawl vessels, and these Trawl vessels are going to be using large or small foot ropes, or they might be shrimp trawls, or a selective flatfish net. They put the nets out into the water, and they're pretty good at finding their targets, but they put the net through the water, and then they see what they catch. Fixed gear fisheries are not nets. So we've got longline vessels, and we have some that use this tub gear that you can see in the top left and they'll tie those together until it makes a long line, might have thousands of hooks in it. But we also have some that are just jigs or rod and reel. If you're familiar with sport fishing, that kind of fishery. Fixed gear also encompasses pots or traps. As you can imagine, 1,300 miles of coastline and all these different ports and all these different fisheries and all these different gear types means we're gonna have a wide variety of vessels maybe as small as a skiff, maybe as large as one of the mothership catcher vessels that goes out for a month at a time with the Hague fleet. So what kind of coverage do we have? So these are some stats from 2019. The, the West Coast program had 79 observers. We went out on 328 vessels for 2,082 days. So our trips can be as short as one day I would say averages three to five or seven. And then we have some vessels that could actually be out for a month, relatively rare, but uh, it can happen. We ended up with 5,329 sea days. Our At Sea Hake program had 43 observers. They're covering 15 boats. And these are mothership vessels and catcher processors. These are some of the really big boats. They had 79 trips because their trips are much longer and they have 1,878 sea days. So just to get an idea, the percentage of the trips that we're covering, this is from 2018, but 2019 data is very similar. At the top, it says IFQ fishery. That's our catch share program. So remember, it's 100% coverage, and you'll see most of our numbers are darn near 100%. Only reason it would be a little less is there could be really bad weather. Observers, unfortunately, sometimes get sick or injured. So we might have a couple toes that aren't observed. Down below, we have our different fisheries for the non-catch share program. And you can see we prioritize limited entry sable fish. We have a higher percent of that fleet has been covered based on landings. And we have to prioritize where we put our observers. So some of these fisheries have a lower percentage. Who are these observers that I'm referring to? So they all have to have a bachelor's degree in one of the natural sciences. It has to include some biology. They need to have experience with dichotomous keys. 
they also have to have some advanced math and statistics. So they're actually contractors and they sign a contract with observer providers. Here's some of our folks. Some of these might be out right now, out at sea. As you can imagine, working at sea has a lot of challenges. You've got, of, of course, limited time and space. You've got long hours. You've got uh, a variety of sambling situations you could be in, different boat, boat types. And on top of that, it's a dangerous job. Fishing is one of the top 10 most danger, dangerous professions. And that also extends to the observer. So that's why we have a very vigorous safety training. So those training activities, so for 2020, what an interesting year it's been. Our At Sea Hake program had four trainings and those are four days long. The observers in that program all have to go through a three week long uh, training in Alaska before they can do Hake. And they trained 53 observers. The West Coast, we hold briefings every year for observers who wish to continue and return. And we want that, we want that good retention. They go through a four day briefing for that. And we held six of those for 47 folks. And then we have our new observer three week training. Those are pretty intense. We trained 39 observers. And that was even during the course of a pandemic. So in the before times, when we could all be in person, the three week training, as I mentioned, is pretty intense. We've got a lot of sampling information that we need to share with these folks on how to sample and how to record it. They need to be able to identify any of the different fish species that they come across. They've got a lot of resources to do that, those dichotomous keys. And our safety training, we pride ourselves on having the best one in the nation. We get to do things really hands-on, partly because of our facility here. We're close to the, the water, so we can get out in the bay. And also we can use vessels. Sometimes folks will let us do drills on those. And so for folks at the Hatfield campus, you may have seen us at some point. Uh, if you've seen folks hats firing off flares down at the beach, or we'll even fight fires using a bullock system in the back, you've probably seen us running around. Then when the pandemic hit, things had to change. So this was our last class. So we did two weeks remote, trying to do everything via, well, Zoom, something like that. And then we still have some things that can't be done online. Uh, you have to be able to feel for head spines on a rockfish, for instance, you can't replicate that. So we had to come up with a modified way to train, maintaining social distancing whenever possible. Of course, we were always wearing masks. And at one point we even had some people virtual and some people in person. So that was an intense week where they covered all of their fish and safety training. So what are we training them to collect? Well, our top priority is going to be protected species. We have some protected fish stocks like salmon, green sturgeon, or eulicon. There's also seabirds, maybe a sea turtle, and marine mammals. But we wanna record as much data as we can whenever there's a sighting, an interaction, or an incidental take of one of those species. We're gonna get all the fishing effort information, the data that could be used for that catch per unit effort, and we're going to have really accurate breakdowns of all the different catch. Starting with just an overall view, what is the observer total catch estimate? On trawl, they're gonna focus on discards. So discarded species is something that either there is no market for it or the market's not good enough, or it was just accidentally caught and it's nothing they could retain. So sometimes things have to be disposed of at sea. Well, once they're gone, they're gone. So that's what the observers are there for. And we're gonna have them focus their effort on the highest priority species, those that have uh, an IFQ quota for it. But we also do a little bit of retained sampling. After they've identified things, they've sorted it, they've weighed it, they've counted it, they'll also collect some biological samples from it. Maybe lengths, it could be age structures, it could be fin clips for genetics. We do have some specimen collections and some collaborative projects that I'll talk about. 
We also pride ourselves on having a very innovative data collection system. So through the very hard work of some of my coworkers, we have folks right now at sea on trawl vessels collecting with a waterproof tablet. They've developed software, they enter all their data directly in to this tablet. And we're also close to having this uh, for fixed gear as well, and we would be the first in the world to be able to do that. So these research partners that we have, I'm just gonna highlight a couple projects so you can see the role that observers played in it. So some of the green sturgeon stocks are listed as threatened or endangered. So we need to know a lot more about them. So the green sturgeon tagging project was uh, put together with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Southwest Fishery Science Center, and with the fishermen, the California halibut fishermen themselves. So observers were actually tagging using pit tags and tagging sturgeon. We wanted to see if the same fish were being recaptured. This fishery is shallow, it's shallow water, and there's generally not a lot of catch, so the fish don't suffer a lot of net stress. So a lot of the times, or most of the time, the green sturgeons are still alive. So they're alive and they're being released alive back into the water. So our observers were tagging them. There were also some tags that could collect additional information such as time and depth. So folks in this crowd definitely are familiar with the uh, regulations now that pink uh, shrimp nets have to have lights on the head rope. That was through research from, you know, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and also Mark Lomelli. Uh, they were trying to find out or they were researching how lights can affect Eulicon bycatch. So Eulicon is another listed species and they're currently, they're usually found with some shrimp. But by putting lights onto the head rope, they found that the amount of Eulicon that were being caught seemed to be reduced. So what we now do is our observers record different bycatch reduction devices on a form. We're recording what lights there were, how many, what color, which nets, where they are. And we're also expanding that out to other trawl vessels. Are they using escapement windows? Do they have modified uh, trawl net mesh? Things that, anything that could reduce some bycatch. You might also recognize this one too. So Dr. Dr. Lori Whitekamp uh, gave a talk a month or so ago about Pacific lamprey. So this is something we've partnered with her to collect lamprey out at sea because we just don't, she doesn't know much about what they're doing out at sea. Our at sea Hake observers uh, encounter these fairly frequently. So they, they've collected a bulk of the samples, but they're also encountered in our shrimp fisheries. So observers will collect some of these lamprey and they're also taking fork lengths on, on a few of them and then collecting some and bringing them in for analysis. Another project that we've worked on is with Washington Sea Grant. So this was investigating uh, for seabird deterrence. So observers were placing uh, time depth recorders onto long line gear as it was deployed so that we can figure out what the sink rate is. And the sink rate's important because seabirds like a free meal and they'll dive and they'll get hooked on, on the hook trying to go for the bait. So we needed to know how long will that gear float in the water before it gets too deep for short-tailed albatrosses to get hooked on it. That data actually fed into the Pacific uh, Fisheries Management Council, the regulation process, and that was how they created seabird deterrence regulations for longline vessels. And we have additional collaborations, and this is not a complete list. Uh, we've had a standing relationship with Oregon and Washington Fish and Wildlife Service. Some vessels that target sable fish will head and gut the fish at sea. So there's no head anymore. And when they come into port, they can't be sampled by a port sampler. So since our observers are out there at sea, they're able to sample that and they take sex and length and weight. And then they also collect otoliths or those age structures. Our observers will also collect either tissues or whole specimens 
for other listed species like salmon, marine mammals, eulicon. And sometimes it's something that we've been requested to do. So California Fish and Wildlife has asked some of our observers to do part of their crab test. When uh, they're getting ready for the crab season for Dungeness crab, they want to know if the meat content is high enough in the crab to make it worth commercially fishing. So our observers go out and they take some samples out at sea, sex and length, and they also will take some for domoic acid testing. So what makes it unique, what observers do, is that they're out of sea in commercial fisheries, and they're a great platform for collecting data that couldn't be collected normally. So I want you to keep that in mind in case there's some sort of a project that you've thought you would like to do and uh, you need an observer to do it. So we will throw that pitch out there that if you have something you'd like to work on, you can contact our program and we can see if we can assist you with that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Dr. Kate Richardson, and she's going to go over the different data products that we've produced. All right. Thanks so much, Krista. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. I'm going to take that as a yes. <laughs> All right. Um, so as Krista said, today I'm going to tell you about uh, some of the places where our observer data goes after our wonderful observers collect it for us. So next slide, please. Uh, so some common users of our data include the Pacific Fishery Management Council, uh, fishers themselves, stock assessors, and uh, a number of researchers both inside and outside of NOAA, um, as well as state partners and others. Next slide. Um, but before I get into that, I'm going to talk about work and collaborations that the Observer Program staff scientists are directly involved with. We have three analysts on our team. Those are Kaylee Summers, Jason Janet, and myself. So I'm going to be talking about work that is done by one or several of us, um, along with collaborators. So this is definitely not all work that I myself have done personally. Um, and it's going to be a pretty high level, quick overview of a whole bunch of different things. So I'm just going to throw kind of a smorgasbord at you. Next slide. So as Krista mentioned, some of our fisheries are fully observed, meaning we have a pretty good idea of what total fishing mortality is, both uh, discarded and retained catch. However, uh, for the fisheries that are not fully observed, we need to figure out how we can use those observed hauls to make uh, inferences about what's happening in that unobserved portion of the fleet. And we do that in a couple of different ways. Next slide. One of the main methods that we use is called the ratio estimator approach. It's a pretty simple method. We assume that total fleet-wide discards are equal to the discard ratio multiplied by the total fleet-wide effort. And that discard ratio is the ratio of total observed discards to total observed effort. And in both cases, we measure effort as the retained target catch. Um, in some ways, that's maybe an imperfect measure of effort, but the really handy thing about that is that we have access to fish tickets, which basically represent a census of fishery landings coastwide. So that gives us a pretty good idea of what effort is happening in that unobserved portion of the fleet. However, um, one issue with ratio estimators is that they can be volatile for years with low coverage rates or low bycatch. Um, in an extreme example, if we had a fishery with low coverage, say 10% of hauls were covered, um, and we didn't see any bycatch of a certain species in those hauls, we would have to assume under the ratio estimator approach that there was no bycatch in the rest of the unobserved fleet. And I'm sure you guys can all think of reasons why that's possibly not true. So um, we get around that by uh, using a Bayesian approach. Um, we particularly use this for species that are encountered less commonly, things like whales and seabirds. Um, and the general idea is that we model the uh, observed takes as a Poisson process, where the rate parameter is the product of the estimated bycatch rate multiplied by the observed effort. 
Uh, we then estimate fleet-wide bycatch by sampling from the distribution of total bycatch in proportion to the binomial distribution function. And we repeat that process for each MC-MC draw to propagate the uncertainty in the estimates through the uncertainty in the expansion. Um, and we do this largely with a package created by uh, our collaborator, Eric Ward at the Northwest Center. Um, that package is available on GitHub. I have the address down in the corner if this is something you're interested in. Um, I encourage you to check it out. It's a really cool package and has some cool functionality that I won't go into. Uh, next slide. So here's an example of an application of that Bayesian bycatch model. Um, the colored lines here show the output from the Bayesian model for a couple different measures of effort, either a number of hooks, observed routine, or number of sets. And the output from the ratio estimator are shown in these open circles. Um, and what you can see is that uh, those ratio estimates tend to be much more extreme than the Bayesian estimates. And I want to point out that this is work done by Anna West, who was a Hollings scholar with us last year. Next. Um, so this is actually some work headed up by Brian Stock, who was a graduate student at the time. Um, he was collaborating with Jason Janet and a few others. Um, and what he did was he used observer data to fit several different kinds of models that incorporated spatial covariates. And he found that overall, there's actually a weak relationship between observed effort and bycatch, and that spatial models, uh, particularly generalized additive models and random forests, uh, pr provided more accurate, as in lower root mean squared error, but also more biased uh, estimates of bycatch relative to that traditional ratio estimator. Um, I just wanted to touch on this really quickly because I think it's a really cool analysis and because I think um, alternative, alternative methods for bycatch estimation is a really important research area. Next. So we put out a number of reports and other publications, some of which we put out annually or biennially, some of which are more uh, one-off. Um, our main research and reporting areas are ESA listed protected species, uh, seabirds and marine mammals that don't fall under that ESA listed category, ground fish, salmon, and Pacific halibut. Next. Um, under the biological opinion for the ground fish fishery, we are tasked with accounting for the impact of the ground fish fishery on ESA listed species that may be subject to take by this fishery. Um, as Krista mentioned, those protected species include eulicon, short-tailed albatross, humpback whales, leatherback sea turtles, and green sturgeon. Next. Um, so every two years, we produce reports with the observed and estimated bycatch of these species. And I'm showing some results um, from the last reports, which were published in 2019. I'm uh, not showing any leatherback results here because they are encountered so rarely by our fisheries. But on the right side, we have eulicon at the top. You can see that eulicon bycatch is really variable through time. Um, it's likely due more to uh, changes or fluctuations in the stock. Uh, Short-tailed albatross bycatch also fluctuates, is, rel is generally relatively low. Um, green sturgeon bycatch also fluctuates through time. I'm actually showing the northern and southern distinct population segments and the different colors here. The southern DPS in yellow is actually the one that is listed as threatened. And if you can see the dotted line along there, it may be too faint, um, you can see that um, we are, we have consistently been under the threshold set out by the biop for green sturgeon bycatch. However, um, the story is a little bit different for humpback whales um, in the open access fixed gear fishery or in the limited entry sablefish and combined open access fixed gear fisheries. Um, estimated humpback bycatch has been above the threshold set out by the biop. Um, although, uh, this is pretty challenging to estimate because we've actually only seen two observed humpback whale takes through this whole time period. Um, and due to these estimates, as well as some other evidence um, uh, separating out humpback whales into these distinct population segments, um, 
NIMPS reinitiated ESA consultation for humpback whales. Um, so we will see what the outcome of that is in the future. Next slide, please. Next. Um, so I'm not going to go into this too much, um, but we also keep track of seabird and marine mammal bycatch for other species. Um, that are not ESA listed. Um, if you're interested in this, you can go to our website and find some uh, estimates by species and by sector. Next. Uh, we have also identified some sources of seabird mortality that might not always be easy to spot because observers can't be everywhere at once, as you can imagine. Uh, for example, at sea hake, vessels have a data cable, it's also called the third wire that stretches from the rear top of the boat down to the net. Um, and we know from other fisheries that birds that are attacking the offal plume um, may be struck by this third wire causing mortality or injury. Um, so we did a short term project where we had observers watch for cable strikes um, and we found that we've likely been greatly underestimating the impact of these cables. So for example, in 2016, observers only saw two black-footed uh, albatross mortalities, but when we account for those third wire hard strikes, there are likely more like 47, although there's a lot of uncertainty around that number. Um, this project actually led to a cable strike mitigation workshop that brought together um, researchers, industry, and NGOs to try to come up with some ideas um, for reducing the risk of uh, cable strikes on seabirds. Next. Uh, we also use some of the information on seabird bycatch that we generate to do outreach to fishermen at the port level. Um, that consists of these uh, sort of brochures that have information about uh, observed seabird bycatch in that particular area, why we care about seabirds, um, what the regulations are around seabirds and seabird bycatch, and best practices for reducing seabird bycatch. Next. So switching gears a little bit to ground fish, uh, one of the key benchmarks for fishery management is the ratio of fishing mortality, including both retained and discarded catch uh, to management reference points. Um, and on the West Coast, those management reference points are the overfish limit, which is greater than the allowable biological catch, which is greater than the allowable catch limit, which is greater than the annual catch targets. It's just a salad of acronyms for you. Next. So in order to facilitate this, every year we publish the groundfish mortality report. Um, and that report analyzes and estimates discards, landings, um, and other information for fish and some invertebrate species that we observe. Um, we use landings from unobserved sectors, as well as mortality estimates from research projects and recreational fisheries um, in combination with our observer data to do this. And on the left, I'm showing you the percent of that allowable catch limit for rebuilding species on the top and total mortality on the bottom. Um, those rebuilding species are cow cod and yellow eye, although I will point out that cow cod was just declared rebuilt, which is awesome. Um, and on the right side, I'm showing you the same thing for some highly targeted species. Um, you can see that the percent of ACL actually varies quite a lot between species, but for some high value species like petrolli and sablefish, um, it tends to be very high every year. Next. So Kaylee headed up some research on trends in discarding behavior before and after the implementation of that catch series program that Krista discussed. Um, and what she found was that discards were lower and less variable after the implementation of the catch series program. And this was true for both quota and non-quota species, which is interesting because at least in theory, fishermen have very little um, motivation to avoid discarding non-quota species or to avoid bycatch on quota species. Next. 
Uh, we also produce estimates of Pacific halibut bycatch mortality in observed fisheries. This information is used by fishery managers, both at the Pacific Fishery Management Council, as well as the International Pacific Halibut Commission in order to inform stock assessments and fishery management. Next. Uh, we also produce bycatch estimates for all salmon species encountered every year, um, though we do focus on Chinook and Coho because both include multiple populations that are listed under the Endangered Species Act. Um, salmon bycatch in groundfish fisheries has the potential to cause friction between the groundfish and salmon sectors, and this has especially been the case for Chinook salmon, and high levels of bycatch in some years have created an ongoing fisheries management challenge. Um, we have a postdoc relatively new to HMSC, Philip Shirk, who's gonna be working on this issue. Next. So that was a very quick overview of some of the things that we do in house with this data or in collaboration with other folks. Um, but as I mentioned, uh, we have a lot of external users of this data. Um, one of the major users are uh, stock assessors. Next slide. So for those of you who aren't fisheries people, stock assessments are these models of fish populations that uh, often form the basis for fishery management. They tell us things like how abundant a stock is, whether it's overfished, how much we can harvest, and if a stock is depleted, how can we rebuild it? Next. Um, observer data plays a really important role in many of these stock assessments. Um, one of the main roles it plays is um, it allows us to characterize discard mortality, which is a really important component of overall fishing mortality. Um, and the biological data collected by our observers on the size, age, and sex of harvested fish also plays a role in uh, many of these stock assessments. Next. Uh, the Pacific Fishery Management Council is another big user of our data. They are the regional council that develops fishery management measures for the commercial and recreational fisheries on, uh, in the federal waters of the West Coast. Um, and the way that process works is that an emerging issue um, may be identified by any one of these groups, um, and then it goes through a whole decision-making process. And observer data may be used pretty much at any stage of this council process. Next slide. So these are just some examples of the ways that observer data was used at council last year. Um, so for example, some essential fish habitat and rockfish conservation areas were open or closed um, based off of observer data, um, as well as observed coral and, in, and invertebrate encounters that indicated habitat that could be important for conserving. Um, observer data informed the 2021 and 2022 harvest specifications, management measures, um, is really important in identifying this uh, short-bellied rockfish bycatch issue that some of you may have heard about. Um, basically, we were suddenly seeing enormous amounts of short-bellied bycatch, um, as well as a number of other issues at council, which I will probably skip for the uh, sake of time. Next slide. So I hope um, some of this was interesting to you. Um, and if you um, are interested in getting your hands on some of this data and you can't find what you need on our website, you are welcome to contact us. We can work with you to try to provide um, data that will be useful to you. Um, one caveat I will give is that we are bound by certain um, confidentiality rules um, that kind of limit the resolution of the data that we can give you, but um, we are always happy to work with other uh, researchers um, and other folks outside of our center. So please do get in touch through our website. You can also email me um, and we can talk about the data. And that's everything I have. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you both so very, very much. Uh, Krista, did you have anything else you wanted to add before we go into questions? Because we're getting some for sure. No, I do not. 
Okay, so um, that was a lot of great information presented in a, a very timely fashion, um, but I think we've got some questions. Krista, uh, the first one that I'm seeing here is, can you talk a little bit more about the Catch Share program? Um, you said it was funded by industry. Was that a government mandated program? Yes, it, it is. So, um, I mean, the Pacific Management Council uh, comprise, comprises some industry also on it. So it's just part of the, the process that they came up with 100% catch accounting, that everything would be an individual quota. It could be bought and sold. The types of gear it could be fished with. And so initially there was heavy government subsidization for that. Observer programs collect a lot of really great data, but there's a cost involved with that. So it was heavily subsidized to begin with, and it's been tapering off, and I'm not sure where it's at right now. And um, was the industry involved in designing that program here locally? Yes. I'm sure there's some partners who might disagree with that, or they didn't feel it was enough, but these decisions are made with industry. And I, I feel that we have a great relationship with industry on this coast, and they're heavily involved with the council and with the decisions that are made. And John is actually online answering some of the questions on chat as well. Um, but I'm going to read this one because I think it's good for some of the students. Um, somebody was curious about, um, you talked a little bit about the degrees your observers have, um, but not necessarily their experience. And so um, this question asks whether your observers have prior field experience or professional experience before they become observers. I would say most folks are fresh out of college, so they do not have other experience. A lot of them do not have field experience at all. We've had folks who have botany degrees, so they, it's a natural science. They've used dichotomous keys, they've had math and statistics, and they decide they want to try fish. And they, they learn it and they can get through it and do very well. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a fish background either. Um, those are some transferable skills. Um, so you don't have to have much experience. You just have to have the education because that is part of the requirement that's in the reg as far as who can be trained as an observer. Um, we have a question coming in um, and they qualify the question, even though I don't think they need to say, I'm not a fisheries person, but can you talk a little bit about ways that I can be more mindful as a consumer um, around bycatch and the seafood that I purchase? That's a great question, and NOAA does have some good resources for that. There are, I know what the acronym for it is, but I'm trying to think what the full name is. Uh, but there are consumer groups who will rate fish based on how sustainable the fishery is. Uh, for instance, like the pink shrimp fishery here, uh, because it has, uh, because of the way it is observed and it is managed, it is considered one of the more sustainable ones. So that has a higher rating. And I will please ask any of my colleagues who are listening to, to put that in the chat. Um, so I'm trying to think where those resources are. Thank you very much. I see that Marine Stewardship Council. So that's one to, to go to. And also like on a NOAA site, there's some information. <laughs> Everybody's putting in their favorite. Uh, uh... So well, that's great. Thank you, everybody, for a community response. Um, we have a question about, are you familiar with observer programs in other um, countries or in other ocean areas? Um, can you speak at all to the differences or similarities between what we have here in the US? There are quite a few of them. I'm not an expert in that. But we actually do have uh, international fisheries observer conferences. Uh, this last one, unfortunately, has been waylaid by the pandemic. And that's our opportunity to get together around with the programs around the world and compare and contrast what works. Um, it, I know that they're very different. You know, the fisheries themselves are different, the deployments. Um, so it would be hard for me to try and say what's, what's to compare and contrast them. So I think basically I've just dodged that question. <laughs> <laughs> that is okay. That came in from Michael Banks, and I think it was a prompt also to his students and to put you on the spot. So I think you did a good job. 
But if I had made it, if we had the conference this year, I might have had a much better answer for that. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, it looks like I've caught everybody's questions, but if there's anybody else that has a question that they want to put in the chat here in this last few minutes, please do so. Um, let's see. Uh, well, the what are the restrictions for going at sea now that COVID's affected the observer program? Can you talk a little bit more about where you're at now and how you're dealing with the challenges of COVID? Yes, so, you know, fish are food. Fishermen are essential workers. They're feeding the country. The observers that monitor that fisher, those fisheries as well, as well are. So when COVID started to hit, um, it, it, everybody had to make adjustments. We did have a two week standstill where no one was deployed. And during that time, the observer providers and industry came up with a plan for how can we try to do it, continue to observe as safely as possible. And so now things have changed. There's a one-to-one -one relationship with observers and vessels. Before observers could move around, you know, we'd have to move, observers would have to move from boat to boat for logistics. But now they're trying to maintain this relationship. So it's the same observer. They have a lot of really strict self-isolation rules that they need to follow. So life for the observer has definitely changed quite a bit. But all of those sacrifices have allowed us to continue working and observing. Uh, different programs in the country have had to shut down for much longer. But because of the work that the providers and industry and the observers did here, they've been able to maintain it. So going forward, I think we're just going to have to keep going with that model where, you know, it, it's a lot of self-isolation if you're not on the boat. And when you are on a boat, that's your boat for a while. Um, so, Kate, I think this question is for you. Have uh, the observers noticed any migration changes and fishing patterns due to climate change? Is that something that you can see or tease out from the data that you collect? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one thing I will say is that there are so many interesting things that I think we could address with our observer data that we just don't have time to do. So maybe this is another plug for you know requesting our data if you think you have something interesting to do uh, with that. But um, one example I will give is I mentioned um, there's this big uh, short belly bycatch issue last year. Um, and short belly is a species, it's not actually targeted um, by any fishery, but it is caught as bycatch. And historically, we were mostly only seeing short belly off of California. But in recent years, um, its abundance seems to have grown and it's moving up into Oregon and Washington um, and causing all these issues with bycatch because um, that was just an unanticipated uh, phenomenon. And I don't think it's been 100% established yet, but I think um, the scientific thought is that that's likely due to um, environmental impacts, potentially climate change. So that's one uh, example of how uh, we're seeing changing bycatch likely due to changing climate conditions. Yeah, just on the water, you have lots of data, lots of things that we're not able to see. So that's pretty amazing. Um, so uh, another question, I think just trying to understand a little bit more about the observer program and Kate, maybe this is for you again. Um, do the observers ever actually work specifically on analyzing the data or writing reports or doing publications? Can you talk about that relationship with your the observers and the data? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've worked with several observers um, to analyze some of the data. Um, they've given presentations at this um, observer conference that Krista was talking about, um, or given presentations to other observers. Um, and we're definitely always happy to work with observers. Um, I get the sense that they're often so busy observing, they don't have as much time as they would like. Um, Krista may, may be able to uh, to confirm or deny that for me, but um, there are definitely opportunities for observers to collaborate on um, doing analysis, and we definitely um, encourage that. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Krista, this one's for you. Uh, based on um, having to go to a virtual training, can you talk a little bit about um, what was challenging and maybe what was unexpected benefits to having this change? Can you find the silver Absolutely. lining? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can tell it well, yeah, there is a silver lining. Um, the challenges, there were many, and one of which is that, you know, folks, we have to teach them how to be entering this data into a tablet 
but also what to collect and how to collect it. And we have we have a variety of hands-on activities, uh, including if you remember the photo, it had a whole bunch of stuffed fish. Those are weighted. They actually sample the catch. They enter it. They weigh it. We try to help help them understand how to sample a catch because they have a lot of different decisions to make. And we couldn't do that. <laughs> so we had to do everything remotely. And on speaking of challenges, the second day of our online training, the first one we've ever done, is when the fires melted the fiber optics cable to the coast. So second day of online training and there's no internet. So we, <laughs> we had to scramble and resolve that one by calling into a conference line and sharing presentations with PDFs. Now the unexpected benefits though are uh, the level of engagement from each individual student. Fortunately, that September class we had only had eight students and that turned out to be a great number. That was perfect because you could ask polls or ask questions and everyone has to be engaged because you never know when you're gonna get called on. And I felt that in that sense, it was a lot, it was a lot better. And uh, it was like being in your living room. And I knew that no, everybody could see well. <laughs> there was nobody in the back of the room who couldn't see the screen. So a lot of challenges, but there were some positives from it. And we're going to have no choice, I think, but to continue with that in the future. That was my question. Is that the plan as you move forward and the next trainings that you're going to be doing is to do virtual for now? Anyway? Yes. Yeah, our, our training season starts in December. We'll start briefings and we'll have briefings in January. And then the first training is usually around February. Then we have one in March and then we have one late April. And so right now I'm planning on we're going to have to do the exact same thing. If it gets resolved and we can meet in person again, I'll, I'll look forward to being back in the same room. But otherwise, we're going to plan on remote for two weeks and then in person for a week. Um, and as we're getting wrapping down with time, can you just talk a little bit about if any of the students that are online now are interested in um, possibly joining you um, in the near future as an observer, where do they go to get more information? So our website, we let's see if I can pull that up. You can check that out. You can also, oops. All right, I can't get to it quickly. <laughs> um, you can also feel free to contact me if you want and I can share information. So observers are uh, employed by observer providers. So there's a couple different companies that have the certification to do that. So people who are interested will actually uh, be hired by the observer providers and then they'll coordinate when they train. But that's information we can help you get. Perfect. And John is uh, back in the chat answering some more questions more in depth. So thank you so much for helping us out, John. Appreciate it. And Kate, the same question for you. For the collaborators that are online, is there a place or a way for them to get a hold of you um, specifically if they want to um, dig into that data a little bit more? You talked about it briefly, but I thought we just might remind folks of where that was. Yeah, if you head to our website, um, which I it up. I can probably put it in the chat as well. Um, we actually just read it our website, so I forget exactly what the uh, um, what the website is. But here, I've just pulled it up. I got, um, it. I got it. Oh, perfect! And there's Thanks your so contact much, John. <laughs> Yeah, um, you can find our. Oh, there's the link specifically to um, some of these reports that we put out. Um, so you can check those out, and then. Um, if you want more information, I think the best way is to just email one of us, either myself or one of the other analysts um, or John, and we'd be happy to, to chat more about the data. Perfect. Thank you both so very much. And thank you for just being open to the opportunities for collaboration and working with students. And the work that you do is just amazing. And we appreciate you sharing with us. So thank you both so much. For everybody online, thanks for joining us. That was a big group of us. Uh, thank you so much for spending your afternoon. Um, and maybe we'll see you next week, same time, same place. So until then, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks now. Thanks all for being here. Bye.